Hello, welcome to Global Talk number seven. My name is Erin fernandez Mommer. I teach Spanish and Humanities here. Um, also help to create the Global Studies concentration. And today we're so lucky to have uh, Paul Mativier and uh, Gustavo Martinez here um, uh, discussing pottery. Paul Mativier is a pottery professor at the college. He started his career in community college as an art major. Um, he's currently working on his 15 year working here at Green River. He focused on drawing and painting primarily and mo then moved through photography into what is called printmaking before graduating and transferring to California State University in Long Beach in uh, Los Angeles to be printmaking major. Um, Mativier decided to take a pottery class. Um, after taking the pottery class, he decided to pause the transfer process to continue his pottery. It was quite a shift from going from 2D to 3D and using different types of materials. Um, and I can let him talk about his perspective here. Um, also, the second half of this global talk is Gustavo Martinez, uh, originally from Mexico. Yes, um, He's worked in Guatemala and Nicaragua with um, uh, potters from around the region to uh, create different projects. He's also worked in Tanzania um, to create pottery with a group of local women potters. Um, and I will let him also talk more about that. I'm really happy to hear um, Paul and Gustavo the potters and the art uh, department, they're like the happiest department on campus, but they're also very profoundly academic. So we're gonna have a good time for the next hour here. Let's give them a round of applause and welcome. Thank you guys. Thank you. And so uh, this is kind of a little strange for me to talk in a microphone, so I have to get used to that for a few first few minutes. But um, so welcome. So I thought I'd start the talk showing um, basically the oldest ceramic object that has ever been excavated by archaeologists. Um, and it's kind of, as we were discussing just a minute ago, Venus is a very misleading um, kind of name for this type of figure because this object was created by a culture that is often kind of re referred to or described as a gynocentric society that worshipped female deities. They didn't have male gods. Um, a lot of the ceremonies took places in caves. And, and whatnot, but what's unique about this object, different than maybe the, the, um, the woman that you're most familiar with possibly is Venus of Willendorf, right? Um, this is not far from where she was found, and it's Venus of Donice Venus. I, anyway, I practice and practice. I cannot say that last word. What's that? Bestonisi. Bestonisi. There we go. <laughs> and it's essentially uh, uh, was found in what is today the Czech Republic. Um, what's unique about this object is not only how old it is, but when you look at this object, it's not like this was the start, right? You have to realize that people were probably working with clay and tempering clay all along. And, what I, and why I say that is when you look at how it's crafted, it's very intentional, right? It's a, it's a mature woman who was likely pregnant or is pregnant, right? So this is, um, as archaeologists describe it, possibly connected to fertility rituals, right? I don't really know the context, and either do archaeologists, because we're talking about 25 to 25, 25 to 29,000 years ago, which is really hard to relate to if I, if, for myself, right? Like, how do we even imagine something that old? Um, it's amazing that it, they found it in two pieces and were able to um, put it together. I also want to mention, so what is ceramic, and how is ceramic different than clay? Clay is the material that is a, pro a byproduct of erosion, and so it's global. It's all over the world. Wherever rivers are running, wherever it's raining, wherever the wind is blowing, um, there is erosion, and so we have clay deposits in those regions. And it's a global phenomenon in the context that people are all over, all, are all over the world as well. And so our interaction with this material um, we can't really measure. We do have examples that go back as far as 37,000 years ago, right? In the caves of Lascaux, there are ceremonial clay objects that were never fired. Clay objects are different than ceramics because it takes the temperature of about 1,000 degrees to change the makeup of, ceramic, of the makeup of clay. And so ceramic is technically the first altered material that humans um, created. It's a synthetic material. It doesn't occur naturally, right? But it's something, it's essentially the first material that um, we created. And it's those kinds of things as, a, uh, as an artist that fascinate me, right? Is that this isn't something like a rock that's been carved. This isn't like wood that's been carved or a basket that's been weaved. 
it's a process. And that's something that as an artist I really began to bond with from the beginning was, okay, there's the making of it, but you're not done, right? You have to fire it, and then after you fire it, which is basically tempering it into ceramic, then you glaze it, and then after that process, it goes into a kiln again, and then comes out as a glazed object in a very contemporary Western um, culture, right? And so a lot of things happen along the way that are completely out of your control in that process. And so I have two pictures here. The other one is the oldest pottery shards, right? Um, on your left are these um, basically 20,000-year-old pottery shards from China. And um, likely these pottery shards came from a pot that was in the shape of a bag. A lot of pottery, a lot of this early pottery was um, created by hunter and gatherer cultures. And so if they were creating pottery, they often made it in that location, buried it or left it, and then returned to that um, at the same time of year. Right? That's a common model. Um, or it was a liner for something like a basket. So a lot of early pottery shards, we find um, basket texture on the outside of, of those shards because the, those shard, that clay actually lined a basket. And that basket, or that, that, those, yeah, the clay that lined that basket may have been tempered by an unintentional fire. We don't really know how people learned how to fire. How did they discover it? The only thing we do know is that people have been, humans have been working with fire for so long that they figured out all the different things that they could do with fire. It could light the night, it could keep them warm, it could cook their food, it could help them digest food better, they could defend themselves with it, right? They could even fight each other with it, right? And so to the right is a timeline. And this is kind of where I enter um, ceramics in a different um, uh, kind of stat than, than I enter ceramics uh, different than the status quo. And what I mean by that is when you look at that timeline, depending on what culture you're from, you probably see things that are missing. You might realize that if we're looking at North America, North American ceramics that goes, that goes back you know, easily to 6,000 BCE, there's no reference of the Maya. There's no reference of pre-Inca society or Inca culture. You would know that people were making ceramics in North America at least till the, the 19th century. Maria Martinez is mentioned in this timeline, but that's the problem with some of these timelines is that they tend to um, uh, they tend to mirror those who create them, very simply. And so when I look at ceramics, I I look and teaching ceramics, I look at it what I call I teach from a studio art perspective. And what it is is that I spend a lot of time making art just like I spend a lot of time teaching, right? I also have a family and do other things, but, but I teach from a studio artist's perspective, and, and what I do is I do a lot of exploring, right? I explore a lot of ideas about ceramics, and I research, I don't just, I'm not like ancient aliens trying to connect um, dots that don't really line up. I'm looking for these models that, that there are some actual connections to. And so, in this slide, that's my studio, um, my work tends to take on three different um, forms, and that is zoomorphic. You see the, the teapot with the crows. Um, the central figure is I do a lot of figurative work, and I tend to work with surfaces that are trompe l'oeil. Basically, it looks like wood, but it's clay. It basically fool the eye. And then pottery. And pottery is very central to my relationship with clay because it's a place where I can play without any expectations. I don't ever feel the expectation to finish the things that I throw on the wheel. And at the same time, um, it's something that I interact with every day, right? Um, most people know that I walk around campus with a, with a cup in my hand, right? Um, and and it's, it's not just self-advertisement. It's that I'm, I'm, I'm asking myself questions about that cup. Why does it feel the way it does? Do I like this cup? Why don't I like this cup? Um, those simple questions is where I kind of begin to explore. <clears throat> in, um, when people first take my class, what I begin to talk to them about is um, what I call a, an effigy vessel or a morphic assignment, where students are, are taught the basics of hand building, which is essentially where people began. When, when um, beginning to build with clay, they used coils, they used slabs, they pinched, they formed clays, they modeled it directly with their hands. There, there really wasn't, there's really no evidence of, of machinery or a mechanism involved. 
And so on your upper left is, is an effigy head from the Mississippian culture. And um, what, I, what I love about these forms is that they're vessels, but they're also symbolic. And they were likely used in rituals. And why do I say that? Is that most pots, and when I say pre-contact or prehistoric or archaic or Neolithic, most Neolithic pots are made to cook in. Right? So potters are making pots to cook food in. So most of those vessels, are, they'll have texture, they'll have patterns and designs, but they're um, created to serve a specific purpose. And so when you look at pottery like the Mississippian culture or the, the central um, pot um, by the Maya or the pre-Inca vessel by the Moche, what we're looking at are vessels that were special. The people who were making these were making something special for someone special. And it, likely there was ritual involved. In many cases, they're grave goods. And more than one was created, right? And, and sometimes the people making them were also special. Most, um, when you look at ancient pottery, most um, archaeologists agree that women were the first potters. They were the ones who were creating the vessels. And it has a lot to do when you look at vessels that are, that are part of a village or part of a society. Um, women were, were making the baskets. Women were, were primarily the vessel makers, right? In the hunter-gatherer hunter matrix, the men are out supposedly hunting or taking a nap somewhere. <laughs> and the wem, women are making um, vessels to store food. To secure the food supply is very important, right? As I move on, um, demonstrating kind of the global aspect of, of pottery, I like to show students when they're, when they're thinking about the subject matter of their vessel, I like to talk about the figurative aspect, which is fairly obvious. When you look at um, the pot on your, on your upper left, you can see that that vessel has a foot, it has a shoulder, it has a belly, it has a neck, it has a handle, it also has a lip. And we can apply those metaphors to the pot. So these pots just aren't pots. They're pots that are communicating something. Um, the pot on the far right is a zoomorphic figure. Obviously, the bird or the crane meant something um, very special to um, people that live in Mesopotamia, right? Essentially, in um, what was uh, these desert climates. And so these objects aren't ar arbitrary. And as I move along to, like, because I have that theme, architectonic, absolutely. How do we know what Han Dynasty architecture looks like? Because it was created in ceramics. And so not only do these um, objects transfer narratives, but they provide us with information and insight um, to what things look like. You know, that, for example, in the Han Dynasty, the wealthy were concerned with a lot of what wealthy people are concerned with today, which is to protect themselves from others. Right? This is it was essentially a watchtower to defend a, a wealthy person's home, right? a private estate. Um, the duck vessel to Korean society is, is very connected. And you think, well, the duck, why, why the duck? Well, um, and this was described to me from uh, Sanjay. He's the one that made the bottle in the middle. Uh, Sanjay was making these um, duck vessels in the studio. He was a university, uh, the professor at the University of Seoul. And uh, he was selling pots to continue kind of his tour of North America. And I asked him, I'm like, duck vessels? Why are you making those? He said, well, in Korea society, we see the duck as a very spiritual creature, that it carries a spirit. And, and that the, this, this duck, this very humble bird that looks sometimes very clumsy, has all this understanding about the world. And I'm like, really? And, he, and he's like, yeah. He goes, if you think about it, the duck knows how to swim underwater. It knows how to paddle on the surface of the water. It can walk on land, and it can fly in the sky. And it's still just a duck. And, um, and so it's revering what is very humble. And we see that in, in Korean ceramics quite often. And to commemorate an animal is not uncommon. We still do that today. Most of us in our kitchens will have images of a cow or a pig if you're not a vegetarian. If you're a vegetarian, maybe a leaf of lettuce or a radish. But we do see that we still tend to um, picture or, or repeat what it is that we adorn and it helps sustain us. And I will talk about the Jamon in just a, a second. The Jamon pottery, until those um, shards from China were found that are 20,000 years old, 
the, the model was believed that only um, that pottery really emerges with civilization. That hunter and gatherer societies really didn't make pottery because they're always on the move. And they're so busy looking for food and hunting um, for bounty and securing the food supply and, and securing um, procreation and things like that, that they don't have time to make pottery, that pottery's too cumbersome and heavy, right? You could have other uh, containers like leather, like a boda bag um, or something like a gourd, right? Um, animal skin bags. And so the Jamon culture um, was always looked at as the earliest pottery prior to the discovery of that. Because Jamon culture goes all the way back to about 15,000 BCE. And so they're considered the earliest pottery. And what's interesting about the Jamon culture is they weren't agriculture, agricultural. They were, um, they were hunters and gatherers, but they weren't migratory. And that was different about, um, about them. And, and of course, it's the artist in me that think that Jamon society must have been this kind of Shangri-La, right? Where you just have, there's fruit on the trees, there's fish in the water, there's all these wonderful things, including the pots that they think predominantly, especially during the middle Jamon, were made by women. Um, these particular, that particular vessel is one of the flame vessels, and they look like fire, they look like vines, and they're so, so biomorphic that it's hard not for me to be interested in in knowing more about these vessels and wonder what life would what life would have been like in ancient Japan. What is Japan today? All right. So my students all get to not only hand build, they come into the potter's wheel and it's pretty abrupt. It's like, okay, that hand building that you were doing, where you're kind of sedentary, now you get to get really messy, right? And so um, they get to explore the potter's wheel. And one of the things about the potter's wheel is I've often talked about it as something that the Egyptians invented, invented. And one of the things that I do as an academic, like I said, is I'm always researching the information that I understand. And one of the things that I've been really struggling with is I found out that that's wrong, right? Is that the Sumerian culture is given um, credit for the invention of the potter's wheel. And I was at a lecture just last January where two Iranian potters were um, kind of telling their own history, right, as Persian, uh, of Persia, and said, you know, we're the, the ones that invented the potter's wheel. And so now I just say Mesopotamia. <laughs> and the Middle East, we know it came from there. Because it also shows up in China, um, and we don't know if that was independent of the other inventions, right? It's likely that things move back and forth across the desert because of the river system and the Mediterranean Sea, but I don't really know how the wheel develops in China. And what we see in this hieroglyph is an insight to how it really is a village that fires a pot. We see multiple people contributing to the production of pottery, and that's what the potter's wheel brought to um, the pottery. When, when we're coil building, essentially every household, it wasn't as specialized a skill, but now that we have the wheel, one potter can create pots for the entire village. It changed the way commerce. It also changed who's making the pots. What we see in the hieroglyphs is that women are not making the pots. We see that men are making the pottery, right? It's entered the commercial um, uh, side of things. And so at the top, you have a guy um, finishing a bowl at the top left. Um, we see um, the guy at the top middle, he's firing a kiln. And on the far right, um, uh, a, a, another potter is bringing clay to the potter who's finishing a pot on the wheel. The second level, um, you, have, you see those guys stomping? They're mixing clay, right? So our pug mill's down, which means that's what we get to do next week, right, you guys? <laughs> but they're actually stomping clay to mix it to prepare it so that um, the clay can be used on the potter's wheel. In the middle, you see them loading a kiln, and then um, that, that basket full of pots, he's headed to the marketplace. And then here are further uh, productions. I believe that the scribes on the wall um, is, a, uh, is in reference to inventory. All right, so not all cultures made pots. Not all cultures used the potter's wheel. Um, it's a kind of a, a big statement to say, well, in the Americas, what we know is the Americas today, there was never the potter's wheel, it, it, not until contact, right? Um, that's a typical perception. And recently I've been kind of just struggling with, well, let's define what the potter's wheel is, right? Um, because those early potter's wheels, when we look at the Sumerian potter's wheel, 
are pretty crude. But what I have been researching is that, so what is the relationship that cultures have with clay that aren't known for creating pottery? Because it's not that they didn't have clay. The Pomo tribe lived along the Russian River in Northern California. And they lived, you know, basically all the way inland to the sea. So they completely had contact with clay. And yet they wove baskets so tight, tightly, that they hold water. You can boil water in these baskets, these pomo baskets. These, this basket is called a gift basket. It would have been given to a young woman when she came of age. And they know that these are special because um, they are often found in their graves, right? That these women were, were basically buried with their baskets. And um, they would do things like boil acorns in these baskets. How would you boil water in a basket? That's a, your survivalist question. Um, basically by cooking rocks, making them hot, and putting them in the basket full of water, and that's how you'd cook in a basket. Um, don't put the basket on the open flame. <laughs> it's not going to work. So what did, the, what did I learn by looking into um, these things uh, is that the, the Pomo did understand how to temper clay. And what did they make? They made ammunition for hunting, right? If you think about a slingshot or hunting with a slingshot, controlling the, the size of your ammunition is key, right? It saves you a, a bunch of time, right? You don't have to go find the right size rock. And so um, what I'm beginning to understand is that um, potentially maybe the understanding of tempering clay with fire is something that was in what I call the archaic toolbox. And it's because um, I found pottery in Alaska up there in the, the Aleuts made pottery, right? What are they doing making pottery up there in the permafrost? right? Um, well, they're making pottery to cook down the, the, the sea mammal fat, right? Pottery works great for that. Why don't we see those pots in the timeline? Because they're not beautiful, right? They're, they're fairly simple cooking vessels that um, are completely carbonized with animal fat, right? And so a lot of what we know and what is written about has to do with our own aesthetics, and I mean cultural aesthetics. North American, Western European aesthetics, what we perceive as beautiful, beautiful, exotic, and desirable. All right. So I'm, I'm um, somebody who's, you know, grew up in Western, um, Western society and education. And one of the first kind of famous potters I was ever introduced to, not personally, but via a textbook, um, is Soji Hamada. Soji Hamada is a national treasure. He was a living national treasure of Japan. Um, he is uh, one of the key players in, in, the, in the folk um, pottery and studio art movement, studio potter movement of the 20th century. And what, we, um, what, what I like most about Soji is not only that he's a clay guy, right, like all clay people um, that I get, get along with, is when I was reading his book, out of all the information, there was one comment that kind of stuck with me. And, and so I have a bowl. This is the kind of bowl that I make today off the hump, just like you see Soji. And there's no accident to that. It's because I've made lots and lots of bowls. I have no idea how many bowls I've made in my life. But um, what he says in kind of a page and a half, he says the inside form tells us what the outside shape should be. And what I love about that simple statement is it gives me kind of a cornerstone to look at student work from which to grade. Often in art, we're, we're deemed as, oh, grading's fun for you. You just look at art and grade it, right? Like, we just throw it all up in the air, and whatever doesn't break gets an F, right? Um, who knows? I've heard all kinds of things. But um, really, there is, because humans have been making pottery for so long, we do know how to look at it, right? We can say, this is good because of this. And this needs help because of that. And masters like Soji Hamada helped us see that. Now, one of the problems with, with 20th century United States, 20th century ceramicists, is that we have a movement called Anglo-Asian pottery, which was something that, as a kid, I really didn't identify with. Because I grew up in Southern California, and most of the pottery that I saw was either from Mexico or from the American Southwest, right? Going to museums, local museums, looking at local collections. I didn't see fine wares from China or Japan unless I went to 
Los Angeles, um, the LA uh, um, Asian Art Museum. And that's where I saw it. And a lot of that stuff seems so tight and so tidy, right? Where there's something about looking at, at objects that really have no glaze. And so when we get into um, firing, one of the things that I think is really important for students to experience, ceramicists in general, if you're gonna, going to work with clay, that we de demystify it for you. That you be involved in the, in the complete um, process. And so we teach um, students how to fire, and we usually begin with a process we called raku. Ironically, where does raku come from? It comes from Japan, right? Of course it does. <laughs> the, that's the thing is when you're in academics, you keep running into these things. And so one of the things that I think is important is to share the context. That what we do today is American raku. We don't do the raku that is done in Japan that is associated with the way of tea and the tea ceremony and the samurai and all that beautiful narrative that comes with raku. That's not what we do in, in ceramics. We do an American version. We took uh, Paul Soldner, is probably the most um, uh, famous potter to bring raku to America. And of course, what did we do? We Americanized it. He brought it to the US in the 60s and made it psychedelic, added a bunch of heavy metals to the glazes make it really pretty, and it's like a fish lure. Everybody looks at it, and everybody wants to do it. What I love most about Raku is it exposes um, students to heat that they've never felt before. When we open that kiln, it's at 1,850 degrees Fahrenheit, and most of us haven't felt what that feels like. And so when you're exposed to that, it's very memorable, right? Because <laughs> you're faced with a primal fear. Do I reach in and grab my pot or, or, or do I say, Paul, <laughs> Heather, <laughs> can, you, can you help me out? Um, and um, anyhow, it's, 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 so I keep this firing included in the program because it's a great way to help demystify what firing is and how glazes have temperatures that they melt at and how, um, and one of the things about this glaze firing is it only takes about two and a half hours. So we load the kiln in the morning, and by lunchtime, you, you have your pot in hand, potentially. The cup. The cup. I love cups. I love cups a lot. That's my cabinet at home. I call it tumble stacking, all right? Wherever it'll fit, and when I know that I have too many cups is when I have to remove cups to make more room for more cups. Um, the cup is another example of an object that is created that we... And when it comes to assessment, it follows that same idea that Soji Hamada talked about. Inside form, outside shape. This is all in context to utilitarian ceramics. And, and um, the thing that I love about the cup is it's so, um, <clears throat> it's so, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm kind of breaking my train of thought. It's, it's more personal than other objects because we do things like, we hold it in our hand, right? We connect with it that way. How Most of us, maybe some of us have um, our favorite cup in a cabinet, right? But we hold it in our hand, and then most, most intimately, we put it on our mouth, right? And hopefully nourish our bodies with what's inside. And that is a very romantic way of perceiving the cup. And I don't know how else to perceive a cup as a maker of cups, right? And I teach my students that they have this unique opportunity to be the designer, the implementer, right? The inventor, or the subverter, right? Because it is an art class. You can subvert function, right? You can put spikes around the rim, right? <laughs> All that kind of stuff. <laughs> All right. And then um, another uh, form of firing, this comes from Germany, um, uh, German salt, basically salt glazing or salt firing uh, comes to us from Germany. Um, I think it was, yeah, it was invented in the 15th, 14th, 15th century. Um, their earliest pieces are pretty crude. We have no idea how um, ancient Germans figured out how to throw salt in the kiln or why it happened. We don't know, maybe because they're all so drunk. We, don't, we just don't have any idea. Um, one, thing, one thing we do know is that it was the only innovation in the Middle Ages, in, in the Middle Ages during Europe. It was the only innovation to ceramics that they contributed to was salt glazing, salt firing. But this innovation would lead us, Western Europe, into 
the Industrial Revolution because it circumvents having to glaze. And it's gone global, like Sunjay's bottle here, right? This is a Korean bottle. It is salt glaze. There is no glaze on it. Um, so what is salt glazing? What we do is we fire the kiln to cone 10, which is 2,381 degrees, and we throw salt into the kiln. At that high temperature, sodium chloride molecule splits in the sodium and the taxi aluminas and the silicas and the clay, forming a natural glaze, melting the surface, essentially. And so what you see in the, in the imagery are, are basically what the kiln stack looks like before and after, but in the middle here, it's kind of hard to see because of the lights, but we have students working in teams, two brave students basically sticking salt burritos into the back of the kiln while they're shadowed by two other students who are pulling the hot brick out. And then, of course, um, Heather and I standing around watching them do the hard work, right? And then I'll show you, on, I'm on the, the left there, or on your right, pulling a draw ring. <laughs> So if we're glazing the pots by throwing salt in it, how do we know when to stop, right? Because we could just keep throwing salt in there and getting thicker and thicker glaze. Well, we have these small rings of, of clay or ceramic in there, and what we do is we pull them out at 2,381 degrees, and that ring will then go from, that, from the kiln into a bucket of water, and within minutes we can see how saturated or how coated our pots are with that sodium silicate surface. All right, so one of my first mentors in pottery is Maria Martinez. And this is where kind of I talk about being from the Southwest and influenced by the Southwest. I saw her film my first um, semester in pottery, which was at the community college. Don Jennings showed um, Maria Martinez's uh, 16 millimeter film back in the day. And I was, it was like nothing else I could think about. I wanted to do a pit firing because I go, Don, how would, how would I go about pit firing my work? And he goes, well, take three pots down to the beach, stick them in the fire pit, and, and then when you're done, bring them back and we'll talk. He just wanted to see if I would do it. So I, I got five pallets of wood, and my brother drove his truck. I had a motorcycle back then, so I didn't. So he basically drove me down to um, the beach. I got five pallets of wood and three pots and um, lit this huge fire. Before you knew it, I had the police there and the, the lifeguards, because it's 7 a.m. on a hot summer day in, in Huntington Beach, California. And um, the cops wondering what I'm doing, and, and the lifeguard's like, oh, do you have Larry Wasserman's class? And I'm like, no, I'm in Don's class, because he had pit fired before. And um, I took those three pots, and that was essentially where I started. And I began to learn more and more about Maria Martinez and, and her generosity and how she um, is a revivalist. So by the 20th century, most of your indigenous pottery in America has died off. Most of those traditions have disappeared. Most of the techniques are, are looking crude because they've lost their vitality through trauma, right? Society has changed drastically. People are being pushed into different corners of, the, of our geography. Right? And so this would affect what the wear looks like. And Maria Martinez is somebody who learned from her aunt how to make pottery and then practiced and researched. And her husband, Julian, became the painter. He's in the central image. And then eventually her son, Popovide, would um, be the painter of her pottery and a painter himself. Um, <clears throat> she would live almost 100 years, work well into um, late 20th century and um, make a huge amount of a huge body of work but most importantly influence enormous amount of potters in her area because she shared what she knew right she was sharing her techniques there's even evidence of of her going to the southeast and sharing with with um, the Cherokee and the Catawba potters of the southeast how to make um, what's is called a wedding vase, the double stirrup spouted um, piece. And so um, there's plenty of evidence kind of around um, the states of her influence and her impact. And, and so because it left such an impression on me and I continually kept doing pit fire, when I was in college at, at Long Beach, I was the only one who was pit firing. They're like, oh, you're the pit fire guy. 
And everybody wanted me to be like the party thrower at the beach because I pit fired. But that's what it wasn't, it wasn't that for me, right? For me, it was my area of research. And I really needed to control my own firings. And so I did it quite often solo um, and continued to become familiar with the police and the lifeguards at the beach. But you can't you can have as tall a fire as you want. You just have to stay within the firing. Um, and so today, after years of doing workshops, I've taught pit firing every summer and hopefully this spring quarter um, here at Green River. This is a photo of our firing team last summer for the inaugural um, pit firing um, we did in um, 2018. What we do is we burnish our pots, we prepare them. We actually do a low bisque firing, which um, keeps them resistant to cracking and breaking. And um, we put things like anything from cow dung, seaweed, um, including copper carbonate. Um, we put a bunch of ingredients in there, salt, right, for flavor, <laughs> and, and basically build a big fire, let it burn up, burn down. And when the pots come out, they look pretty, um, pretty crusted, right? And then eventually, um, in fact, there's a picture of, there we go, picture of Heather pulling out the pots, right? It's probably a 90 degree day that day. And so standing around a hot metal box, um, probably around 110 degrees around that box, pulling out pots. And um, when they're washed off, these were two pots from that firing, um, that particular pit firing. And you can see they take on all different colors, red from the copper, orange from the salt. Um, we have steel wool wrapped around them. That's the crusty areas. That thing that looks like an eye is actually a barbecue briquette, right? So rather than cow dung, in the southwest when I was um, doing a lot of pit firing, I was using a lot of cow dung. Um, I can tell you in the northwest it's not a really good place to collect cow dung because it doesn't dehydrate, right? <laughs> and when cow dung is dry, it just burns really well, like a briquette, right? You could have a barbecue with that stuff. Um, probably not, <laughs> I wouldn't do that, but anyway. <laughs> but, but when it's wet, it doesn't burn well, it still stinks, and um, I'm sure there's some, some bacteria in there. One of the things that I'm continually doing is looking in our community for um, connections to ceramics, traditions, and culture. Um, last fall, there was a coffee shop in, in downtown Renton that opened up called Boom Buna. And when I read their like, little business thing, I'm like, oh, I got to go check them out, right? Because one, they're going to talk about the origins of coffee. I like coffee. I drink coffee every day. Um, but also, remembering that the origins of coffee, coffee comes from West Africa, right? Um, so often, I think of it as something that comes from Latin America. Um, but that really has to do with the history of agriculture. And um, one of the things they do at this coffee house is they do the, the Ethiopian or the, the East African um, coffee ceremony. And what you see right here is a vessel, vessel that is on the open flame, boiling our, basically brewing our coffee for us um, with raw clay. And that's something that, you know, after I saw that, and what's great is if you go, it's um, Saturdays and Sundays from 12 to 5 at the top of the hour. I recommend making reservations. But they do the coffee ceremony. They, they brew the beans. See the top left? They're actually brewing the coffee beans right there in front of you. Then they grind them. It's the freshest coffee you'll ever have in your life. Kind of a, a, like the strength of espresso. It's just really a wonderful experience. And of course, in 115, that's one of the projects that I have my students do, doing is to create a, a jabina, right? Which is the name of that coffee vessel. And we're going to experiment with clays and ask ourselves, why is this pot cracking on the open flame or why is it not, right? And so, all right, you guys, so I'm going to hand the, the, the floor over to uh, Gustavo. Yeah. Thank you. There you go. So I'm going to start with a um, YouTube uh, clip. Um, one of my favorite books is um, The Alchemist. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with it. The Alchemist, I highly recommend it for anybody. Uh, it's, a, it's a must read. Um, I 
think everyone should read *The Alchemist*. Um, it um, relates a lot on uh, about on the hero's journey. Uh, life begins when we step out of our comfort zone, and I'll um, let Jason Silva talk a little bit more about that. So I think it's beyond the cool idea. It's, it's something that I like to put myself in. It's something that I, I see as a, as a way to uh, have meaning in my life. It's to uh, connect with uh, people, connect with communities. And um, I've been blessed with uh, a gift that I didn't even know I had, which is um, able to transform materials. Um, and I tapped into that in undergrad um, with, uh, with clay. Um, so I'm going to kind of back up a little bit. And um, I was born in Jalisco, uh, Mexico, um, Guadalajara, right here. Um, and uh, my family migrated um, to the US when I was about five. Um, through the amnesty of 1985, uh, um, my parents were able to uh, uh, come here and were able to uh, uh, be uh, permanent residents. And they were working the fields um, along with my, my older brothers. And uh, that's one of my brothers. Uh, he's, he's, he's my hero. Uh, I look up to him so much. Uh, that's me on the left. Believe it or not, I was full on blonde. And I don't know how my hair just got curly now. Um, so during high school, um, it was challenging for me. Um, it was, there was a lot of um, things. I, I felt like I was always in the wrong place at the wrong time. <laughs> and um, sports. Um, and art um, got me through through high school. It was a way for me to uh, tap into uh, this moment of, of bliss that um, I couldn't really uh, uh, explain, but everything was right in that moment. Um, and um, I developed a discipline through sports and uh, junior ROTC, palm trees. I kind of miss them up here. It was everything I saw in California. Um, so when I when I was in high school, this was kind of my thing. This, I, I did this uh, Prismacolor in high school, um, and uh, it felt like this in a way. Um, I, um, I felt like I was uh, in this strange world, and I wanted to just be that, that climber going somewhere else. Um, this is where I wanted to be. This is also something I created in high school, uh, Prismacolors. Um, just um, thinking of... Um, how do, I, uh, how do I connect to this, this universe? How do I connect to this existence? So I learned to adapt. I learned to just adapt like a chameleon. I, I, I learned to uh, not be loud uh, when I didn't have to and to be loud when I had to. Um, 
when I was in uh, San Jose State as my undergrad, there was an assignment, um, go to the um, Museum of Art and pick a, choose a piece and do something else to it. I was really drawn to uh, guardian figures. Um, and um, I, uh, I did this, and it's a bobblehead. That was the something else that I did to it. It's a bobblehead, and uh, my mentors, my faculty began to say, hey, that looks Mesoamerican. I'm like, Mesoamerican? I don't even know what Mesoamerican is. I had no clue uh, what my own heritage is. I, I, I never heard of Mesoamerica, and I was like, Meso? That sounds like a masculine table. For those of you that are in Spanish, mes <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't get it. So um, I decided to minor in Mexican-American studies. And um, along the way, I met um, uh, more mentors. And uh, this is uh, um, another mentor I, I met uh, when I was working at the San Jose Museum of Art. This is a self-taught artist. Um, he worked um, um, with uh, so many different materials, and he just had this urge to create. He did a lot of uh, shields during the AIM movement, the American Indian movement, uh, when Dennis Banks was, was running from coast to coast kind of thing. Um, and he made shields for protection. And I just fell in love with that idea of making something uh, w with meaning. Um, so I researched my own culture, which I had no clue about, and learned a lot about mariachis, where they come from. Um, it said that they were uh, just almost like these nomadic singers, uh, uh, singing ballads, bringing, bringing news to different towns. Um, and they brought news of the revolution. So, um, so I connected that, and I titled these Campesinos Indígenas, uh, Indigenous Field Workers. Um, and on the back, uh, there is this um, snake, or Quetzalcoatl, um, and the horse. Um, so the snake. Um, Quetzalcoatl uh, for Mesoamerica, representing Mesoamerica. Then the horse was reintroduced um, by Europeans to the Americas. Um, and then there was this clash of cultures, uh, this hybridization of cultures, which is now, in, uh, there's books called uh, the, the Cosmic Race. These two uh, uh, fierce cultures clashing in a way and then becoming another culture, uh, mestizos. Um, and I use the, um, the cockfight to, um, symbolize that. And these are um, life-size figures, and they're also bobbleheads. At this point, friends and mentors are like, dude, you got to travel. You, gotta, you owe it to yourself. You, you, need to, you need to go and travel. And right before graduating, um, I spent about seven years in undergrad. So my, my six and a half year or so, um, I was double majoring and minoring. That's my, that's my uh, reasoning for those seven years. But I was developing my portfolio for graduate school, too, as well. So I went to, um, I went to uh, uh, Nicaragua, I backpacked from central Mexico um, uh, to uh, Nicaragua, going through um, Oaxaca, Guatemala, Honduras. And along the way, I kept meeting people. But uh, um, I was going there in, in, in um, response to uh, what Potters for Peace were doing. Um, they're um, uh, teaching um, communities in, in, in Potter's villages how to create a sustainable enterprise. And a lot of that is through um, ceramic water filters. And um, I met the uh, founder of Potter's for Peace uh, in, in, in Managua. And um, it's like, what, what are you doing in this place? This place is really dangerous. Uh, do not go out at night. Um, I was like, oh, I'm, I'm broke. And uh, it was five bucks a night. You know, it's like, uh, OK. Um, Here's $20, and uh, contact this person, um, um, Valentin Lopez. And you don't need me for the tour of the villages. You speak perfect Spanish. Go in and meet them and, and tell them I sent you, and um, ask them um, whatever questions you have. So I, I did that. I went, and this is the, the studio, the outside of the studio in uh, Escuela Valentin Lopez in San Juan de Oriente. And, um, they, he, he took me in, and he's like, all right, um, here, here's, your, uh, here's your bed, which was kind of like a stiff um, um, plastic hammock. And um, I had my sleeping bag, and then I got to connect with um, his family, uh, Valentin Lopez on the right and his uh, nephew on the left. And I learned so much about traditional, um, traditional ways of making pottery. So there's actually on, on the left, um, what Paul talked about a little bit, is you begin to develop a relationship with the clay after you dig it up. Um, so 
there's a tradition of asking for permission of the earth. So by, by um, stepping on it, it's like you're doing a dance and you're asking for permission. Um, so I, I thought, wow, that, that, is, that is beautiful. Um, yeah, I, I like the thought of, of asking for permission and then collaborating with this material. So the, traditions, uh, the traditional way of making pottery and all over the Americas is to burnish it. Um, clay is, is not the, um, the best quality uh, of clay. Um, so to burnishing it, it makes it a lot stronger. Um, and it also uh, makes it uh, less porous and so you could hold, um, hold liquids in it um, without them sort of evaporating out. So this is uh, them putting slip, liquid clay, on, on the pottery and then burnishing it um, and um, kick wheels, of course. And now they're demonstrating how they use the liquid uh, clay, the slip of different colors, to uh, put the decoration on the surface. And, um, and then they do uh, um, the scraffito technique, as we know it, um, by using spokes from bicycles. And they sharpen them and put them in the center of a pen. That's a great tool. Um, and on the left is the burnishing. And then on the right is the, the carving of the, of the uh, imagery. And then they, uh, then they fire it. And it reaches about 900 Celsius. Um, and uh, this is um, after it reached the temperature, they're taking it out um, so it doesn't keep getting hotter. And um, this is um, some of the work that they make. Um, so then I, I come back to San Jose State, and I'm just so excited with all this information and um, I'm about to do my exit in my BFA exhibition and uh, so I decided to make these these trains I, I, I throw forms and I I cut them up and then I was doing kind of a take on that scraffito technique on the surface of these um, trains um, and these trains um, the concept behind them is they're they're coming out of a two-dimensional wall um, the train being three-dimensional, and then they're incense burners. So I burn copal, and incense being movement, uh, or the, the smoke of the incense being the movement, so connecting to the fourth, fourth dimension. Um, and uh, it's really interesting to talk to anthropologists, and they actually see the connection to the Mesoamerican. Oh, that looks almost like uh, a take on Quetzalcoatl or something like that. I'm like, oh, nobody else would have noticed that. Thanks for mentioning it. Um, so then I, um, I decided, right, I'm going to graduate school. So I applied to the University of Washington, and um, I get accepted there. And so leaving home was one of the hardest things for me. A lot of my nieces and nephews were um, just um, like one or two years old. And, and to me, that, that was, to this day, the biggest sacrifice is not seeing them, not being around them growing. Uh, um, but it, it's beautiful when I go back and connect with them. But I decided to come up here and ask myself, why do I have this urge to create? Why? Um, why do I feel like I just want to create? So um, I decided to get into um, making figurative work that talks about uh, the, the, the human condition. And, and how, how is it? Is it just inside here, or, or is it something else? And you could see that throughout um, um, the world. You know, People asking that question, is the human condition? Why are we here? What are we doing here? So I made more trains, and I began to get into metal. Uh, again, cut up forms. Everything begins on the potter's wheel. At this point, everything I make um, derives from the potter's wheel. And um, so I began to uh, connect again to my culture, Mexican uh, heritage. And um, that image was taken from this figure, which is uh, so much, right? Talking about fertile land, it connects to the uh, story of Aztlan. Um, the um, elder, they got the message uh, uh, when this nomadic, uh, uh, nomadic group of Mexicas are like, uh, wherever you see a, an eagle on top of a prickly pear cactus growing on top of a rock in the center of a lake, and that eagle's devouring a snake, that's where you settle. And it's like, wow, uh, that's a lot, right? But it, 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 that's maybe a, just a romantic story. Um, but it's so beautiful because it connects to the fertility of the land, it connects to dualism, uh, the snake being the uh, terrestrial and the uh, eagle being celestial, and then the bountiful uh, um, gifts from the earth um, in, in the middle of the swamp, 
Uh, and there's a lot more layers of information to this, but um, that was a take on this here, me exploring with different materials and beginning to uh, tap into this thing of like, again, this, this battle between who am I and what am I doing. Um, this is uh, taken from Amazon breaking a horse, breaking in a horse. And I, I call this one um, um, breaking in and then that's when you look at it from the front. Uh, this is a sculpture that I saw in the Cantor Art Center. When you look at it from the left, instead of this clash, there's this becoming of one. There's no longer that, um, that struggle, right? There's no longer that struggle, but there's this, this um, union, and, and it's moving forward instead of moving in opposite ways. So I kind of stopped. I, I began to say, okay, well, I got to stop fighting myself in a way. So uh, began to do these drawings um, on, on the air and just being freeform with aluminum and I learned how to cast and, and then thinking about that moment when everything's about to change, right? So now I'm developing this identity and what do I do with that? So okay, I'm gonna keep connecting with communities globally. So the next project um, that I was involved with was in Guatemala in a ceramic water filter factory. Um, that's um, Montaña del Agua right there, and these are all ceramic water filters. Um, so connecting with this community as a production consultant, I, I, I've learned so much about clay and, and how um, what our uh, bean farmers um, um, are now um, filter uh, uh, makers. And um, so there's sawdust in, mixed with the clay. There's a, um, so the sawdust is what gives the, the, the clay a carbon core. They do a, um, a ram press uh, method. And these are the kilns um, that, are, that are there. And this is a test flow. Water has to flow through these um, filters, uh, one to two liters um, per, um, per hour. If it, it's anything less or more, they get discarded. Then they get impregnated with colloidal silver, and then they're, they're ready. Um, they're ready to be used, and this is how they work. Um, the carbon gets rid of the bad taste, and the colloidal silver kills uh, uh, the bacteria. Um, and then it's dripping into a um, five-gallon container. And what's great about these is that they could go anywhere. You, uh, we were in uh, rural, rural villages where these filters are delivered, and they change the lives of people. They really, re really do. They change their lives. Instead of having to go and collect a bunch of wood um, to fire the, the water to, to uh, eliminate bacteria, um, they now have these filters and it's in a way ready, ready available. I also helped organize uh, um, the first uh, ceramic symposium and a bunch of artists from the community got together and we created sculptures and um, this symposium was to raise money for the local communities uh, um, in most need to subsidize uh, the, the, the filters. That's the, the piece I made. It's um, the the wind um, the the wind deity of uh, Mayan Mayan culture. Um, that's my short-lived uh, um, traffic control in uh, Guatemala. And this was a view from where I was staying. So now it's going back to okay, how is this influence in me? How am I ingesting this experience? Um, this this experience from a completely different culture that I'm used to, and how do I express it now? So that was. One of the first pieces I made uh, um, coming from, from Guatemala, I made um, then also the, the, guardian, the guardian figure. Um, these are all wheel thrown. And then I made um, Tlaloc, which is uh, meaning from the earth, a uh, fer fertility god in the Mesoamerican pantheon, which is uh, the rain god as well. Um, and that's, that's from the back. Um, and then uh, Quetzalcoatl, um, Quetzalcoatl, uh, this is a transformation piece. I was going through all kinds of transformations and how did I express it? I was taking from uh, my heritage and, and um, um, paying an homage to this. Uh, it's a stone, uh, this is a stone, um, well this is ceramics, but it was inspired by a stone uh, uh, Quetzalcoatl of a transformation piece. Then um, this is um, Raku fired, the little piece on the top is Raku fired and the legs are made out of bronze, and this is titled Agua Para Ti, meaning uh, water for you, uh, bringing, bringing life, bringing life into these uh, uh, places that, that um, they don't even have running water. Um, and um, 
the uh, loyal ally uh, uh, mules um, that um, help us carry the, the, the sometimes burden and sometimes life. Um, these are charcoal drawings, uh, uh, five by three feet, um, and then there's a little bit of red iron clay in that uh, horizon line. This is a tidal fuel carrier, again, uh, somebody carrying wood to um, fire their, uh, um, or heat up their, boil their uh, water, and then cook their food. Um, something we, we don't do, right? We, we don't go through that. Um, but this is a, almost a daily thing that they do. Um, water carrier going to the river to carry water. My mom uh, was a water carrier. Every morning she collected water from a river uh, that was about two, uh, two, uh, two miles or so from, from where she lived every day. Sometimes even more than once. Um, had a, she didn't care like this. It was buckets, but just that story of um, trying to reach this this thing. These are uh, images again. That um, what was I going through? And and working in a community that I, and I'm an outsider, and then having them kind of trust me with uh, helping them figure things out um, was not easy, especially in Guatemala when. The Civil War was during my lifetime, you know, and, and a lot of people my age um, uh, went through that. So there's this almost lack of trust. Um, so it was really challenging. And this was me trying to, uh, you can see the filters, water filters in the back, and sort of trying to, trying to reach for this knowledge that, that it was re really challenging for me. And, um, and then um, the idea of the hero's journey, just going on this uh, uh, raft and uh, um, meeting people along the way. Um, so um, then I was approached by La Paz International Foundation to uh, build a ceramic water filter in uh, Tanzania, in a woman's potter village in the Usambara Mountains, which is about a little bit over 8,000 uh, uh, feet in elevation. Um, and this is uh, a market, a market uh, getting close to the uh, Usambara um, village. Um, well, this is the Usambara's mountains, but this is kind of at the bottom of the uh, mountains of the vi village. I love ginger. I don't know if you guys do gingers. Yeah, it's some good stuff. Um, just some images of the market. Something we don't see every day here, right? Just it's like, wow, the, 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 the life um, and, and beauty of these places. Um, and uh, connecting with this community um, is so fresh. I just did this last year, actually uh, a year from um, a month ago was when I first went. I went twice uh, last year. Um, this is a uh, uh, Fatuma. Um, this is how they traditionally fire their pottery, but it wasn't getting hard enough, uh, and it was really fragile because it was, in a sense, still clay. What Paul's talking about, how clay goes from being clay to ceramics. Uh, you have to go past uh, what quartz inversion, where silica begins to, uh, in a way, uh, uh, melt or vitrify. And they weren't getting hot enough. They were barely going at, at under 1,100 Fahrenheit, like just right below quartz inversion. So they got hard enough, but when people purchase these and take them home, they were breaking because they were just um, essentially still, still hard clay. Um, so that's, that's why the foundation um, um, contacted me to uh, go in and build a kiln with them. And this is some of their uh, pottery. Paul has an example here on the far left of, of their, their style, the style of their ware. And um, the black is the carbon of the, the pit fire. And this is how they uh, process their clay. They dig it up and they pound it. Uh, instead of stepping on it like in Nicaragua, they pound it and they break down. It has a lot of uh, uh, tiny little rocks and they break that down and that becomes in a way um, the, the, the grog that, that uh, makes the, the pottery strong. Um, and then this is how they build it. Um, no potter's wheel. They, 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 they turn around a, a five gallon bucket. They, st they start off with a, a round ball of clay and then they just begin to dig it. Um, she's using a mango pit. Um, as a rib. Those of you that are familiar with uh, ribs, and, and um, they're used to give shape, but they're using a mango pit. And um, you could see how short or non-plastic the clay is. Uh, it begins to crack, but then they um, come back with a little bit of water, and then they get a piece of, uh, of, of bamboo or a stick, um, and they um, begin to compress the surface in this way. And again, they keep going in, in circles. 
uh, around uh, around this five gallon container. Um, after they, they, they get the shape, um, they begin to smooth it out, and this is uh, again compressing compressing all the uh, platelets of the clay to uh, give it give it form and, and strength. Um, then they dry it out, um, and um, they uh, decorate it, um, and that's the kiln that we built on the on the on the back there. Um, and um, they'll um, do this if the uh, thickness is too much. Again, the getting that consistent wall thickness. They'll carve it out and then they uh, burnish, burnish that. After they do the pit fire to seal it, um, they um, use a, a, an herb that is actually a, a medicinal, a medicinal herb that is good for uh, stomach aches. Um, and they um, use that and that's what gives the, the, the sheen. That's what seals the porosity of the clay and uh, it gives it that, that shiny look. And this is them on, on a, just a regular day working with each other, telling stories, and sometimes you'll hear a laugh here and there, and they're uh, just sharing um, um, stories through a common, or connecting through a common material. And yes, there's always uh, um, babies around. There's always uh, uh, young uh, children around. The men are usually uh, um, away working, either in, in the town or some other, um, in some other villages, um, working and the women stay in the village um, ma making pottery. These are all the bricks that, that um, we use for the kiln and talk about that expression, it takes a village. This, this is, <laughs> it, everybody, everybody, everybody got into it. Um, everyone, um, that's the, the mason that I work with, one of the masons. I didn't know the materials there so I I, um, I asked um, the foundation if they could get a mason, and I'm so glad. I'm so glad that they had a mason because um, we traditionally cut bricks here by pounding a um, um, pounding an, an, um, a metal on it, and then we score it, and then we pound um, a chisel, and it, it breaks. I tried doing that to one of the bricks, and it, it, it pulverized. I'm like, oh, oh, what did I just get into? <laughs> How do you guys? How do you guys cut these bricks? Because I see you guys uh, need to cut bricks. How do you cut it? And uh, they use machetes to cut it. They just score it. Ping, 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 ping. Like wow, I made it look so simple. But this is what I'm talking about. Everybody was involved. Everyone was into it. Um, the uh, five-year-olds were like, "No, give me some more. I want. I want. I want to be part of this. I want to be part of this." And um, so we're just gathering. Um, um, all the materials, we're, we're setting up the foundation, and wow, talk about high elevation, 8,000 feet, um, I began to feel it, uh, I was like, like shoveling, shoveling the rocks and the, 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 the sand, I'm like, wow, I'm a little winded, uh, yeah, uh, elevation is a thing. Um, so this is, uh, we're starting the, the firebox, and this is a, a, a mason um, um, setting up the um, the firebox, and um, we're just, um, there's the machete, um, the it's ponga, um, what they cut the bricks with, um, and then building the, the arch, again the machete, um, and we work till the end of uh, um, the night, there's no electricity in this, in this village, um, so everything we had to do by hand, um, so I, cutting, cutting wood was, uh, was a workout, um, and this is the the foundation uh, on the top. Um, and ahead of the foundation, uh, Daisy was the interpreter. Um, Leilani uh, was part of uh, building the sustainable um, business, and then Jim is Anna's husband. And then we got to uh, connect with local communities from around the area. This is the last hunter gatherer tribe, uh, the Hatsabe in Africa. Um, they are said to not have a DNA connection to any other tribe. Um, and this is them uh, cooking um, a rabbit that they, um, um, that they were blessed with, I uh, believe, a, a day before. Um, wearing bamboo, uh, or not bamboo, excuse me, uh, baboon um, skin. Um, and uh, and we, were, we went hunting with them. Um, and then um, 
This is uh, a mason, um, not excuse me, not mason. The, these are metal metal uh, workers, the Tonga, the Tonga, um, and the women. Um, um, and I love how they have aloe vera on the top as a uh, medicinal plant, um, in a way almost uh, used as protection in this in this house. Um, and they trade with the hot sabin. They make spears um, out of uh, galvanized steel uh, uh, nails, and then they trade with them. Um, whatever they, they hunt, they trade, um, and they make the, the spears for them. Um, the Maasai culture uh, has a lot of influence uh, in, in these areas. Um, you could see the Maasai blanket and then the, the Maasai bead style, but there's a lot of influence, a lot of uh, exchange of, of um, artistic styles. And then we went on safari. And that's, that's the kiln. We came back, and uh, there was a loss in translation. Uh, they were only supposed to uh, coat the inside uh, to make it fire, uh, uh, fire strength, but they actually did the whole outside of the bricks. So I was like, oh, man, so I'm not going to be able to test fire it. Oh, no, it's so wet. Um, and the monsoon season is coming, so we had to wait for this to dry up. And um, we, we went back in... in in August of last year, and we were able to test fire it, and it was a very, very successful uh, uh, firing. Um, and these are um, the pots right before going into uh, to the kiln. And then we also um, built a, a bread oven for them to create a sustainable enterprise. Now they're making, um, I was just in the Minneapolis, uh, the ceramic conference where La Paz International Foundation is actually based off, and I was able to meet up with the foundation and talk about their progress, and they're doing great. They're not selling the bread yet, but they could actually uh, make the bread for their, their, their community, for the village. So that, that was great news that, that they're actually getting a good use out of this bread oven. Um, that's the, a lot of the, the pots, and they're meeting up and firing, and this is uh, the woman. Um, Quickie Shesha project, um, that's uh, what they, they call themselves. Um, I came back to a Tacoma and Feast Art Center, and it's another community connecting to another community through Clay, and I had a residency there. And uh, this is a little bit of the process um, that I make my work. Um, everything thrown on the potter's wheel, and then um, I um, assemble them and create these uh, guardians. Uh, right before they get glazed, um, and this was a um, at Feast Art Center, and there we connected with an awesome, awesome community. There's Heather on the on the right, uh, doing what she loves to do, is play with fire. Um, um, so Heather brought her uh, raku kiln, um, and we connected to this community by doing a, a um, raku performance and. Um, it was a, a celebration of a community. That's how I like to see it. I didn't see it as my uh, uh, residency opening. It was more of like, let's come together and, and, and co-create. Um, and this is um, making a um, um, pizza oven. We're making a pizza oven. Again, because food brings communities together. And, and so creating this pizza oven, we're picking a, a bamboo to use as fiber to uh, Create um, that that strength in the in the in the dome of this pizza oven, and um, that was one of the last projects that I was involved with. And this is some of the work that um, that I made while in that residency. And um, this is at the Usambura Mountains. You would never see a child running like this anywhere here, right? And then there comes a motorcycle. You'd never see that here in the States. <laughs> um, and this is, in a sense, why I, I create uh, for, for my nieces and nephews. And every time I go back, I try to do some type of art project to connect with them. And we were making, um, um, well, they, they decided to use the glue. We were using the glue for, um, um, what is that called? Uh, slime. Yeah, yeah, it's slime. Uh, they were making slime. And then we were making the um, um, little little rattles from um, popping the balloon and making the the, the rattles. Um, so um, 
So yeah, if you want to get in touch with me. Um. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, yes, question. So one reason that Gustavo Martinez and Palma TV are going to live forever <laughs> is because when you serve other people, um, actually they've done a lot of studies in Mayo Clinic about um, service learning and uh, having a, a perspective of serving others, people actually have less heart disease and uh, less stroke and less cancer and less all of the major diseases. So um, you can always uh, go about life uh, in service to others. I think you'll be a happier person. And then also, um, you probably live longer. So Gustavo and Paul are really good examples. Um, I'm going to open the floor to questions. So if you have any questions, I'll pass the mic. Make sure that you ask the questions in the mic so that we can uh, include it in the, um, in the video. Are there any questions for Paul and Gustavo? Awesome. All right, see you all later. <laughs> Okay, I think this is for Paul. Okay, um, when you were talking about how they cooked with baskets, could you explain that again? Cooked with the baskets, with the rocks, like. I think I think so. Oh, cooked with the rocks and the baskets. Yes. Um, yes. So the uh, the pomo baskets and baskets and that are woven tight enough to hold water. Um, and it, the irony is it was uh, silly enough that it was on one of the Survivor shows, right? Um, but yes, yeah, so the fibers that the baskets are made of would otherwise combust uh, if you're trying to boil water. So what they would do is build a fire and put rocks in the fire. And then once the rocks are hot enough, they'd put the rocks inside the basket that's containing the water. And the rocks won't burn the fibers on the inside of the basket, and then will boil the water and cook any of the contents inside. And it's really quite fascinating, right? And so simple, right? Um, but it was often, um, uh, you know, one of those, when I'd lecture in art appreciation class, uh, Gustavo and I were teaching art appreciation for a couple of years uh, there face to face, I'd often ask that question, how would you do that? Uh, out in the wilderness, because it's kind of a survivalist question these days with our luxury. But um, yeah, that's how it's done. It's pretty amazing. And typically, what would have been cooked is the acorns to prime it for bread. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes. So fish would also be absolutely, especially because they're living along the Russian River, which still has a significant salmon run. Yeah, for California rivers. Uh, uh, most of them no longer have salmon runs except for the northern um, rivers, yeah. So. Any more questions? Okay, so, oh, no, okay. <laughs> so with that, um, we'll conclude for the day. Um, there's another midterm, kind of mid-global uh, talk coming up with Marty Sella, uh, the snow took that away from us last quarter, so we're going to recuperate that in a couple of weeks. And then we have, after that, uh, Josh Kessler from Japanese on Japanese internment, uh, World War II atrocity. And then in the spring, we have Christine Dixon, our anthropologist, who um, did some excavations in El Seren and El Salvador, uh, coming to talk about that. So um, these are the last concluding um, uh, global talks for this year. So thank you so much for coming. <laughs>